Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Goodman with Art Matcher, the mobile app which will bring innovation to the art industry and is coming to you soon. While we work hard to build and release this app, we'll be talking art with some of the industry's most interesting and knowledgeable people. Whether you're an art aficionado or this is all new to you, we'll be here to provide valuable insight and hilarious good stories. Hope you enjoy our chat today. Welcome to another episode of Art Matcher, the podcast in the studio today uh, via Squadcast, Michael Shaw. Um, during this podcast, I'd love for you guys to check out his website so you guys can get these amazing visuals, michaelshawstudio.com. Um, we're going to be talking about his process today. Um, Michael, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely, Michael. Thanks for having me. So I am an artist based here in Los Angeles, uh, same city that you are in, apparently. Um, I, <clears throat> yeah, I've been making art for, for a pretty long time. And uh, I also do a podcast called The Conversation Art Podcast, which may be how you guys found me. Um, I've been doing that for coming up on 10 years uh, ju in just a few weeks, actually. Congrats. Um, yeah. You were going to say something? No, uh, congratulations. Oh, Ten thank you. It's a, is a great you. mark. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've let's see, what else? Not you know. You don't know yet. Um, it's, a, it's a bad habit, one of those filler words that I, that's, that's the, filler expression that I use too much of is, you know, so I have been working in the medium of cyanotype, which we can talk a little bit about for, I think it's going on about seven years now, maybe even eight. Um, Prior and, to that, were you doing, using any traditional medium? Before yeah, I, to what correct. Cyanotype is? yeah, I have a painting background <clears throat> and um, uh, working in oil, acrylic, watercolor, et cetera. Um, and I also worked in airbrush for a number of years. And it was I was actually working in airbrush right up until I made the transition into cyanotypes, which, and I've been able to incorporate airbrush actually back into the process by painting some of the transparencies, which, which we can talk about in a bit with airbrush. So yeah, that's that's kind of an overview. I'm happy to, uh, you know, get into any more detail depending on what you're where and did you where did the, you have yeah. formal training did you go to any formal training yeah i mean yes and no uh i i did go to grad school i went to i went to, i had an undergraduate degree with a fine art uh or studio art major and then i went to grad school and got an mfa master of fine arts um with an emphasis in painting um but you know it's funny when you i have to parse your question, because when you say, do you have tr training, you know, that's a, that's kind of a little bit of a loaded question because training these days, when it comes to contemporary art has a lot of different connotations. Like, because back in the day, even in our lifetimes, depending on the institution, you know, training meant actual studio training, like in technique and whatnot, that is not the education. Like a lot of my peers and colleagues, that we've had, you know, because it's been much more idea, conceptual, uh, you know, et cetera. And wouldn't you say you find based. that more in, in grad school, though, than like, because like, if you did your undergrad, at least from my experience, I did undergrad where I was attending San Francisco Art Institute, and there was that technical, meaning like painting classes about learning how to paint. And that, I guess, maybe the term is formal training. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I, I, ha I have had formal training. I mean, the, the distinction I would make is it's not the, the sort of academy style of training, which is a little bit, which is more classical, traditional, and, uh, you know, tends to be model and still life based. So, uh, yeah, I had definitely had some of that in undergrad and even a little bit in grad, I think. But, um, you know, it's not to the level of sort of craftsmanship that, you know, was more common in uh, art institutions, art academies back in the day. Yeah, that's that can get like, we can have a whole discussion on kind of like 
the institutions and 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 you know the different ideas that come from that. Um, one of the things I definitely want to dive into is this process, which you've been doing now, which you've been referring earlier before we were recording as the cyan cyanotype uh, cyanotype um and can you like kind of explain to the audience what that sure. is yeah so cyanotype i refer to as sort of a pre-photographic process and what i what that means is cyanotypes were actually invented before traditional photography um it's a it's a simpler process and a simpler chemical um combination it's, it's basically two parts uh i could get into the chemicals but i think that might be a little t tmi for for listeners but it's basically part a and part b you mix those together into a liquid into you know a water-based uh, mixture and then you soak or or dye whatever surface that you want to use whether it's paper canvas or another substrate that you know can receive can, can, you know, can absorb that uh, mixture and then you expose it. Basically, you know, most people do it to the sun, but you can do it indoors with UV bulbs. And then you come up with this final image that is an indigo to cyan spectrum with white, of course, white. And then the blues are run from cyan on the lighter end to indigo on the darker end. And so is there, just out of curiosity, is there another name for I guess what we're looking, I'm visually not seeing that whole spectrum from, from kind of like a naive viewer. When they look at your work, they predominantly see what they would, I would think is perceived to be blue. So yeah, is there one that is well, different? Let me, let me uh, in, enlighten you and your listeners a little bit to, to the spectrum. So if you can see this, sorry, listeners, you can't see this, but this is more closer to an indigo right here. This is a cyan, right? And this is a lighter cyan. And then you've got yeah. white here. And then you've got sort of a mid cyan here. So um, in this piece, I actually used layers of painter's tape. So depending on the number of layers, the more layers, the more white it is, the less layers, the darker it is. So this spectrum, you know, which is about five or six, maybe, depending on how fine detail you want to get into it, of darkness or, or, you know, color indigo being like very few layers or no layers. Uh, and then the white being six layers of tape. So all these gradations in between represent, you know, that, that middle section of the spectrum. Yeah. And for the viewers listening, uh, definitely, if you guys can check out michaelshawstudio.com, you can see what we're referring to throughout this podcast. Um, what in terms of you said you started this process about seven years ago uh -huh. or what, what made you like, what influenced you, I guess, to get into this specific kind of process? Like, yeah, it was pretty random. So, uh, or maybe random in, in one sense, but not random in another. My, my studio mate at the time, uh, who was a painter, he saw what I was doing, which was at the time. So I, like I said, I had been using airbrush to make paintings quite a bit uh, over the years prior. And what I was doing at that time was I was making these stencils. So imagine cutting out uh, paper or cardboard, but you, <clears throat> mostly paper, uh, like thin newsprint, cutting it out into a shape and then airbrushing around the perimeter of that shape. You've got, and then you've got a silhouette of that shape, right? I was doing yeah. that with layer after layer after layer uh, of images, uh, these objects that came from this bankruptcy auction, which another story we can get into. But in any case, for, to the formal process, I was using these, like I said, these outlines or these stencil images. And so my studio mate said, have you ever thought about cyanotypes? And I think what he intuited about what I was doing is that I could, instead of using the painted silhouette you know, from airbrush paint or paint, paint through an airbrush outlining these shapes, I could do the same thing using the sun, you know, uh, and, and, and the combination of the sun, the stencil, and then the, you know, the dyed image to do essentially the same thing. 
I think that's what kind of the way he was conceptualizing it. So I, I thought, no, I haven't. I, I answered him, no, I haven't. I started trying it out out of curiosity. And then one thing led to another. And here we are seven you know, plus years later. But it's, it, for me, it's what I think naturally a lot of people gravitate to warmer palettes. Me being kind of in the art business, uh, the art dealing aspect of it, um, what I've learned is these this cyanotype palette seems to be, it reminds me of like Picasso's blue period in that sense. And as we know of that period, it was kind of a very sad kind of his depressing, you know, depression in that sense. Have you, what gravitates you to this? Were you interested in color theory or I guess what I'm asking is what, what got you into continuing into this? Uh, this <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Why, why did I keep doing this depressing blue and white? Um, I wouldn't say yeah. it's depressing. I think uh, for me, it's just, it takes a lot to con- to continue. So there must be something. Uh, right. I think, yeah. More of that. Well, I, I mean, first of all, I, I would, I would, I, I appreciate your, your insight about the, uh, you know, the warmer palette versus the more quote unquote depressing blue. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that's, I don't think that's a universally held opinion. I think uh, in the business, you, you might be right. I think our consultants, uh, you know, may shy away from it because they're more drawn to the warmer colors, the reds and the pinks and the oranges and whatnot, the yellows. But, um, but otherwise, I mean, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't think I haven't thought about it. Maybe it's to to a fault, you know, in terms of the marketer, terms of marketability. I mean, I think I'm thinking a lot more about that lately. But I thought of, I've been thinking of it as more working within limitations, you know, which is always important for artists. You know, if you have unlimited um, opportunities or or directions that you can go in, that's that's too many options, right? So pressing up against the boundaries that you set for yourself is the format or or sort of the structure that I've been working with, right? Like how many different directions can I push into this, uh, you know, blue and white, essentially blue, white, and maybe a little bit of black uh, limitation. Um, And so it's, it's been partially about the process but also about the subject matter. And I think the subject matter that I have become more and more homed in on, which is housing and the housing crisis, I think there's a parallel there, you know, between the limitations of the medium and the limitations of the subject matter, which is to say housing generally and housing specifically for particular individuals. So I suppose you could actually metaphorically uh, or, or, you know, struck theoretically connect those two limiting factors i was connecting them in the sense of when i was looking at as you said my favorite one of my favorite pieces of yours is the uh that just visually holds in is the uh, porter body the porter potty piece um which right. is in the uh right here yeah in the horizontal uh you guys can see that piece it's in the development on the horizon Right. Uh, It's titled, at least on the website, Untitled Spec Homes with Porta Potty. So, yeah, when I see a piece like that, I think the palette, the color is appropriate for a kind of, it's kind of conceptually working with the ideas you're making. I mean, as an artist, you consciously think about those aspects. I would assume you do. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think I think sometimes more than others. Um, you know, I, I, in other words, uh, I didn't choose this these two spec homes that are neighbors to each other within my neighborhood when they were under construction at the time um, because I thought these will make for perfect cyanotypes. I chose them because they were part of my ongoing interests with you know development construction and gentrification in the neighborhood and, um, you know, that I happen to be using cyanotypes. I mean, the other thing about cyanotypes is they are related to the blueprint, right? Which is the architect's blueprint, you know, for planning. So another way I can sort of conceptually think of it is 
this is like a more sort of comprehensive uh, format cyanotype than a blueprint, which is more of an outline, you know, to sort of reverse engineer planning. I, I mean, it's like the result of planning, you know what I mean? So I don't know yeah. if that answers your question, but that that's no, no, I it, think about it. It yeah. does. Yeah. Because we were talking about earlier about there's these certain, certain things that I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you with your process where you could be trying out stuff in this particular piece we're talking about, you were talking, uh, saying how the tape, uh, the, the painter, the, the painter's tape becomes part of the process. And there's, I think, a huge element of like, kind of risk and chance of how that is going to come out, correct? Yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, so uh, for listeners, I, I have been, I've in the past, working with cyanotype, I've done a, like a three or four different sort of formats or approaches. Um, for a long time, for several years, I was using painter's tape as a mask. So in other words, picture a canvas that is layered with different thicknesses of painter's tape. So the more thickness or the more layers of painter's tape, the more white, the lighter the, the eventual result's gonna be, the less layers or no painter's tape, the darker it's gonna be. And so, yeah, I'm basically, um, I'm, use, I'm projecting an image, so I have an image source, but as far as the, you know, the darkness, um, the, uh, uh, the opacity, I should say, you know, that's something that I'm kind of sort of figuring out in the dark a little bit. But as I keep doing it, I get more and more um, familiar with the results. And so it becomes more and more part of my vocabulary, part of my toolkit, right? And then later on, when I would transition to painting or or inking onto drafting film so the drafting film sheet became then the transparency that was laid over the the surface that would be exposed um but i'm still sort of there's this, a certain amount of control but then there's a certain amount of um working in the dark you know like i don't know exactly what this is going to look like what you know as opposed to when you're painting onto a canvas or onto a piece of paper you're seeing it because that's exactly what's happening, right? This way, it's a reverse plus, you know, a whole nother remove because you're working in the dark a little bit. So yeah, there is a certain amount of chance, even though as I keep doing it, you know, I build up the vocabulary. So I have more and more of an idea of what it's going to look like and what I want. So I'm visually conceptualizing this because this is very fascinating to me. So when you're starting your process, if I were to kind of observe you, observe you in the studio, does your process start with a photograph? Like, can you walk us a little bit? I mean, if, if yeah. it's okay with you, walk, walk us through this process. Like, do you start with a canvas, with a, with a sketch of like lining or paint? Because when you were saying you layer the painter's tape, I'm visualizing that and I'm looking a lot of these images that we're looking at it says they're on canvas um is this is this a canvas board is it is a linen like is it a tight right so how would you what would that visually kind of walk me through your process of how fall, the, how the early in the process would you like me to start michael you would you like me to start at the beginning or just at the part where the canvas is involved it's up to you okay that, um let's start with getting to because I know the process can start. I'm not talking about the conceptualizing of it. Right. I'm talking about the actual physical process of sure. like, you know, is it starting with uh, vellum sheets? Like just trying to transfer the image to the final destination, if that makes sense of what yeah, yeah. of what we're going to be left with. Right. Right. Okay. Well, th like I said, the, the, there are two main versions that I've been working with over the last several years. One is the one in which I use canvas and painter's tape. The other is using transparency and paper, although I, and or transparency and the canvas as well. So, so here's what I think you wanna visualize. Imagine a canvas that is either pinned or stapled to the wall. Okay. Okay. 
I'm projecting onto the canvas the image that is my source, right? Okay. Now imagine me with like two, maybe four different rolls of painter's tape. One is the traditional sort of three quarter inch thick uh, width that we're most familiar with. Another is an inch and a half. And then they go up to even like two inches thick, right? And so depending on how wide bands I want to use in that image, I am using the particular um, width of tape and I'm layering it. So, okay, I know I need four layers of this particular tape. I'm, I'm putting down, okay, here's the first layer and then I cut it where I need to cut it, right? And then I just keep adding to that single layer so I have four layers in the same spot and cut or rip as you'll see in the porta potty piece that you've been talking yeah. about they're not perfect they're not always perfectly straight lines right so yeah. that's because I've ripped or I've used an exacto blade to cut out like a little sliver of tape so basically imagine me excuse me imagine me carving sections out of the thicknesses and also just using different thicknesses of the tape into certain configurations. If you look at this, I don't know if you're looking at my screen right now, but this garage, yeah, this garage section right here, this is where I, you know, put down rectangles of tape of the same thickness, but then I carved out the little here, indentations. Right, where, I, where I wanted more darkness to be. So it was kind of like carving wood in a sense, but it was all temporary because one, so the next process, part of the process was that it needed to be exposed. It needed to be turned into a cyanotype. How did I do that? I flipped over this canvas that had all these different thicknesses and carvings and whatnot of tape onto its back. And then the back, which had no tape on it, that's where I could brush on the cyanotype mixture, right? And then God, because okay, it's canvas, now this is... yeah, it soaks all the way through and then I can flip it back over, let it dry. And then the next day I bring it out into the sun, you know, the sun exposes the side that has the tape on it. And then the next process, <laughs> part of the process is I have to put that, you know, dyed canvas thing that I had been working from, from the, from the projection onto the wall. And then this time I'm taking off all of the tape, which in some cases would take upwards of three plus hours to get all of that off. Um, oh, I can and then, imagine. It must be tedious. Yeah, it was a tedious process. And, and, and maybe I can share with you this old Instagram post of me, you know, in fast motion, taking off all the tape. That'll give people a little bit of a, a you know, a, a taste of it. But then finally, after all the tape is off, then I can, you know, develop which in the case of cyanotypes, it's not, you know, uh, developer, fixer, wash. It's just rinse. It's just a straight rinsing process. And then it hangs to dry. And then the next day, it's done. Wow. So this this is this is a pretty intense process because I was, it, it's kind of, I think, and you must get this a lot when people look at your work. I know for me showing a lot of artists over the years, They'll look at a they'll look at a painting. They'll look at an image and say, "How was this done? Is it painted? Is it you know? Is this a photograph?" And uh, yeah, you know the the process over here, I think, is just as I mean, it's, it's just as important as the final piece, and it gives a kind of a lot of insight of how this piece was created uh, created when you see it. So. Um, and wow, these these all share that process. Well, uh, all the, all the ones, a lot of the ones on this page that we're looking at now, which is the um, development on the horizon page. If we actually go to the Crenshaw Corridor page, which is a more recent body of work, you'll act. You can actually see. So here is the cyanotype on paper. Here is the transparency that it came from. But this is ink on drafting film. So this is a little bit less involved of a process. It's still a process, right? It's still inking up this piece of drafting film, right? And then that becomes the negative or the transparency to which this is made. And those are two 
I mean, you consider them two separate pieces or is that? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, it's, it's a question that people have been asking me or like wondering when I've been writing about the work, wondering or speculating, it might be tricky if you show these transparencies with the, you know, the cyanotype together. Like, would that be about the process or would that take away? And and therefore, would it take away from kind of what you're going for ultimately? Because you don't want this to be completely about the process, do you? No, I don't want it to be completely about the process. But, you know, but I, I, I do like these very black, you know, on white images. I mean, they're appealing to me. Um, and yet they are serving a purpose too. They're not a final, they're not the final image or they're, you know, they're not the end result, I guess you could say. So, um, yeah, so that's still something that is not totally clear in in terms of an exhibition context. And so when you're choosing going into kind of the subject matters that you're choosing, a lot of these are, at least what we're looking, have architecture in them what areas is this areas here around la that you're predominantly interested in or where yeah where did your kind of fascination of just what you, what you're depicting comes from in terms of the architecture you're choosing yeah it's 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 the, it's the it's my my own environment you know i mean uh one of the issues that I've been interested in is income inequality. And in, the, the, the interest in income equality led to an interest in housing. And th- those two things combined uh, led to both luxury buildings, but also for a period, affordable housing buildings. Like what are examples of what are called affordable housing and you know what do those buildings look like and um, initially I was just sort of sourcing images from around the web and so they came from places outside of LA including a lot in New York you know maybe one or two in San Francisco etc um, but then I stumbled upon through a friend uh, this organization called Community Core of Santa Monica which owns like a hundred plus, buildings in around Santa Monica that are all just um, known as or, or given the title of affordable housing. And so I was able to go around and actually photograph, you know, these buildings myself. And so that that's been a big part of the process is photographing the buildings that are, you know, initially they were buildings in the city you know, in my larger environment. But more recently, it has tended to be buildings that are in my immediate environment, that is to say, my neighborhood. Um, So the Crenshaw Quarter series that we were just looking at, this is, excuse me, a bit of an outlier or or a, a little bit apart from that model, because these buildings are actually taken from plans, from renderings. Um, I was interested in this, this particular project was interesting to me because the buildings that were being proposed and rendered were all being built around this extension of the uh, metro or the LA subway line, you know, along this area of Crenshaw refer, being referred to, I think it's sort of a marketing term as the Crenshaw Quarter. So they were, these developers were wanting to capitalize on this new set, you know, um, transportation hub, basically. So what these buildings represent are buildings that are planned to be along this corridor. You know, some of them are already approved. Some are in the middle of uh, the approval process. And then others, as you may have seen, and if not, I'll show it to you now, are ones that were denied. This one actually got shut down, uh, as it turned out, because of corruption uh, on the part of one of the developers involved. Um, anyway, so. So this this piece, I like that you brought this up, this one of these pieces, but he's brought up on the screen, the denied, bringing yeah. in typography in the work. Right. That's a whole new element to it. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it contextually puts into something. Now, when you see the word denied, like, what is this talking about? Is it, is it this building? Is it, you know, what, what, what here is denied? So, yeah. Um, that's an interesting uh, piece looking at it. And so when we talk about the affordable housing, what made you get interested in that? Is it, is it something from your own personal narrative? Cause a lot of people here in LA, I mean, it's already like, what is affordable housing here in LA? It's already very expensive as it is. Um, it's something, you know, homelessness is, is on, on the rise and stuff here, especially with COVID. Um, and you were interested in this pre all this. So I guess. We'll, oh yeah. We'll That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, it goes back to income inequality. Like, I mean, I am somebody who has experienced both. Well, I should say wide ends of the spectrum. I don't want to say both ends of the spectrum because that would imply that I'm, I've both been very rich and very poor. poor. Um, but what I mean by that is, you know, I've had access to, or I've been in, I have sort of been in proximity to great wealth. And I've also been in proximity to people who are, you know, struggling financially. I myself as an artist, you know, who, who has not had a particularly lucrative career have been somebody who grew up in a, in a fairly comfortable upper middle class lifestyle, but as an artist have lived in more of a sort of very lower middle class or, you know, just a, a more of a financially restricted um, lifestyle. Right. So, so I'm interested in, you know, in how people travel through life and these, you know, either these different class systems or, or just sort of economic realities um, and, you know, and how that plays out over time and, and how that plays out in the form of housing. <clears throat> and you asked about af what, you know, this thing about affordable housing, the, the term affordable housing is, um, is a little bit misleading, I will say, because <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily mean that, like when we talk about these buildings that are designated as affordable, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're market rate affordable. I, you know, it just means that they're below market rate a lot of the time. And, and in comparison or, or in parallel, or I should say in um, relation to the incomes of the people living in those buildings, it could be much more of a stretch than affordable. Um, and another sort of misleading element of affordable housing, one other thing that I'll say before I um, let you respond, is that developers will often um, develop buildings that have, that have to have a certain percentage of quote unquote affordable housing in the building to qualify to get these sort of green lights, you know, to, to get approved basically, um, and to get sort of city planning support. But usually those percentages are pretty low and, um, and ultimately they are relevant to the market. So they're, or, excuse me, they're related to the market. So they might be, um, affordable according to the market, but according to, you know, individuals' incomes, they're not particularly affordable, if that all makes sense. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's a fascinating way to visually kind of talk about income inequality, the, the interest, and, and it makes me think even right now of, you know, if an artist is tackling this concept of the idea of income, in, income inequality, how do you show it? Is it, are you taking a picture of someone you know, visually what they're looking like, but housing is a huge indication of kind of where we're at. And you could look at someone's house and say, well, if they, they have a big house, mansion in Beverly Hills, they're, they're doing all right, you know, and just these areas that sometimes when I look at uh, your series, the, the Crenshaw Corridor, um, some people kind of steer clear of those areas in general. And, and they don't get visually depicted. So yeah, and, exactly. And, and you, 
in your work, it's, it's, it's shedding a light, um, on this, uh, on, on these areas. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me, uh, let me, to your point, let me, uh, call up this image on my screen. So this, we talked about, you know, you, you asked me about, you know, this, this image is not on your website, right? This is not yet on my website. No, this, okay. this will so we're soon, talking about, yeah, soon be there. this will soon be there. Hopefully by the time this episode comes out, it'll be there. This one, this image is, is called public housing and it actually is public housing. I, more or less within my neighborhood. I mean, it's, it's probably about a mile away. Um, you know, but it, it's, it's definitely in the vicinity. Um, it's, it's actually what people would call the projects, you know, but you think of the West side of LA and you, you think projects and West side LA, well, yeah, this is public housing. So that is to say it's, it's subsidized by HUD, you know, the, um, I don't remember what that stands for, but you know, is the this housing. section eight. Uh, area? yes. Yeah. I, I, okay. um, actually let me take, ch- I, I think is so. I'm sub- not hundred percent sure. I, 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 yeah, it's government? definitely subsidized. I'm not sure if it's technically sec- section eight housing, but in any case, um, the reason I thought of it and I wanted to put it up on the screen as, as you were asking those, you know, making that point is that this is the type of house or, or housing that, you know, you would not typically see in, you know, depictions of architecture and art, you know? So, um, uh, so I, yeah, I mean, part of what I'm doing by picturing these buildings, particularly if they are sort of less than, you know, desirable or, or less than idyllic, I guess, is I'm sort of honoring them, you know, um, by depicting them, you know, and, and in some cases I've done more recently, uh, when I look oh, at this image, yeah, it, it almost doesn't look like an image from 2021. I mean, you're seeing like an antenna. It looks right. It looks like something that has been. I mean, there's a lot of buildings here around Los Angeles uh, that haven't been developed that are old, but this one really looks so so dated. Uh, yeah, to the point it's pretty it's dated. Yeah, about, whenever whenever this building was built, it could have been like in the 50s maybe the sixties. Um, it yeah. It looks no. like it's still there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still there and they're, and they're fighting, you know, they're fighting for their lives to, to hold on to the place, you know, because it's on the West side, you know, which has been so heavily gentrified and, and, and developed, you know, developers want to want access. And so there is a, uh, a tenants association essentially that's part of this community that is, you know, doing what they can to fight, to protect themselves and fight back against development and being taken over, you know, as a so they just want entity. to tear this down and build they would love nothing there. more. I mean, developers, you know, want nothing more than to tear anything down that they're not already profiting from essentially, but especially buildings that are vulnerable, that are, you know, that they see that, that, that the community might complain as being, you know, an eyesore or, you know, or a blight on the, the, the area or whatever. And, and certainly I think I, it's been communicated that, um, from, from one individual in particular who I know who lives there, they have communicated that that's something that people say. And that's interesting. So when you're taking these images and you're going around, you know, you communicating with the people living there, does a lot of that interaction happen with your work where you're actually, or a lot of it's just kind of, because there's different ways to look at art. You could just look at it. You could look at it with a conceptual point of view. You could look at it just purely from an aesthetic point of view, a visual point of view without. But having that interaction with a person who's potentially living there, has that changed? Or how has that influenced your work, I should say? Um, well, I mean, I think a, a, a way to answer that is to say that I have actually been participating in this organization called the LA Tenants Union for the last couple of years. Um, the LA Tenants Union is a, an organization. It's not a nonprofit. It's not a charity. Um, it's basically a, an organization that is about tenants' rights and to, 
also to some extent to fighting gentrification and overdevelopment and and whatnot. But it's mainly about um, empowering tenants and and fighting for tenants' rights. And it has 14, uh, roughly, maybe more locals at this point. I'm part of the West Side local. Anyway, all that to say that this is sort of a parallel activity that definitely informs the way that I think about my work as far as interacting with uh, the way that people interact with the work or, you know, my making the work sort of in conjunction with the buildings or, you know, that I depict that I think is still, you know, slightly in the future. Um, And so you brought up gentrification and that has been a huge influence in the art world and in a way is from your opinion is gentrification you think in regards to development is it good is it bad um gentrification yeah i mean i think it's the 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 underlying problem with gentrification is that so Some people might understand gentrification to mean um, a neighborhood becoming fancier, right? Becoming up more upper, upper, upper scale, you know, prettified, you know, it's bet, you know, it's improving the, 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 the aesthetics of the neighborhood. It's bringing in desired businesses, you know, fancy coffee shops and whatnot. But the, you know, Along with that, businesses and tenants are going to be pushed out in that process. So if you are sympathetic, if you are somebody who is sympathetic to individuals, tenants in particular, holding on, even even homeowners in some cases, holding on to their homes, and to a lesser extent, if you're interested in business owners, small business owners, being able to hold on to their businesses, then you would probably see gentrification as at the very least problematic, if not something, you know, of a slightly meaner word. I, I, the reason why I, I'm, I'm so intrigued with all this is a couple of years ago, I'm not sure if you heard about this, but there were a couple of art galleries looking to move into the Boyle Heights area. And uh, they kind of protested against it because they feared as you bring this, these art galleries, it's going to bring in essentially what you said, they're going to make it fancier, that it's going to drive the existing community. So one of the things I think about being in the arts is where do you find the balance necessarily, um, you know, for it where, you know, where it doesn't become a problem where everyone can coexist uh, yeah. happily. That's a that's a complicated problem. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the Boyle Heights uh, scenario. It's a very interesting one. In fact, uh, <clears throat> um, a story that I was considering exploring for a spinoff of the podcast. It didn't hasn't ended up panning out for now, but you know it could still happen in the future. It's just very complicated. Basically, there is a section of Boyle Heights. It's not really a residential section. It's more industrial. <clears throat> filled with warehouses mainly, Um, but it is technically Boyle Heights and a bunch of galleries moved in there over, I guess, like 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. Um, And the neighbors who are in the more residential section of Boyle Heights, uh, particularly the more activist, uh, I can't remember if it was a particular organization. I think it was a particular organization. I don't remember the name, but... um, a bunch of they 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 organized and long story short they applied a lot of pressure to the galleries and most of them have moved out so they were victorious for the most part um there's still some galleries in the vicinity um the problem that was happening that i think you and listeners can be sympathetic to is that as these galleries started moving in the landlords of apartment buildings started to raise the rent of the tenants, you know, to sort of keep in line with that gentrification. So if you can imagine being a tenant and knowing 
that your landlord was raising your rent because these galleries m- were moving in, you would probably be pretty pissed at those galleries. And so that's essentially, that's a very simplified version of what happened, but that's essentially this, you know, where the tenants were coming from. When you look at your work, um, a lot of these, which depict these certain sites, after you're done with the work, how do you like look at kind of ex- exhibiting? Like, so looking at these different bodies of work, are they site specific sometimes of like the creation of them? Because I always think about when I talk to artists about their work, how do they envision it being curated and exhibited? Mm-hmm. And do you, is that part? I guess of the work is a part of the process after the work is done is are they done individually? Are they done collectively like to be seen in that sense? Right. No, I, I think, I think I, I, part of what you're getting at is, is right. I mean, there is an element in which it would make a lot of sense to, I mean, certainly it would, it would, it would be great to show exhibit the work in a, uh, nonprofit context, um, particularly like, I mean, let me put it this way. I was able to sell one of the, uh, affordable housing angels, as I call them buildings to the community corporation of Santa Monica, this one right here. Um, so they have that in their offices. So, you know, you can say oh, that, that seems like a good, you know, exhibition result, you know, of this piece, you make this piece about this affordable housing building and the company that manages these, these affordable housing buildings has it in their offices. That's pretty cool. Um, but really as far as exhibiting these works, I would want to, I'm, I'm open to exhibiting them far and wide, you know, in commercial galleries in nonprofit spaces in community centers of public housing, you know what I mean? In um, really wealthy people's living rooms, even if just for a night, you know what I mean? It's like they could be exhibited anywhere, anywhere where people can appreciate them on an aesthetic level and also hopefully on a conceptual slash intellectual one as well, you know, is welcome. So um, there's nowhere really other than, you know, a in company of work that I think is not very good company because it's not very good work other than that context like that, you know, it's like, I'm open to the possibilities. Well, the landscape for artists today has changed dramatically of kind of how artists get representation. I'm sure you, you've heard this, I've uh, been going around the talks about NFTs. Uh, sure. Uh, and, it's interesting what is NFT art today. A lot of people gravitate to artists that have any process with a digital aspect, which I'm not sure. Is there any digital aspect? I mean, are you using Photoshop sometimes to create your images before they go into the more traditional process? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I use, I use, you know, digital, um, photo editing tools for sure. I mean, on a very modest scale, you know, I don't do a lot of tweaking, but definitely, you know, changing the light and the cropping and, you know, and, and moving around a little bit, scaling those kinds of things for sure. But yeah, but yeah. And, and then on the, on the tail end, as far as NFTs and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'd certainly be open to some of the images existing on a digital scale. I mean, they do just like everybody's on, on social media. Right. So there is always that, um, the NFT thing I've talked a little bit about on my podcast and NFTs, uh, are something that I'm open to, but you know, I, I, I have enough keeping me busy, you know, without diving into that whole new platform. Because your work, when I when I look at it, 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 I always, being in the business of an art dealer, I think uh, there's like these almost like three categories. You have like fine art, you have commercial art, and then you have something that sits in between. And I think from the business point of view of where kind of artists get placed, um, 
is very interesting as your work kind of sits i feel someone could maybe see a commercial appeal to it but there's a lot really understanding the work you need to have the context kind of what we're talking about uh, of what's going on here uh, beyond what you're seeing just visually uh, yeah. meaning there's there's these there's there's this deeper I- ideas and thoughts about your work and a lot of artists that I've worked with who have uh, come who, who have essentially I come from a master's program of art and maybe you can touch upon this is a lot of it um, and I'm not sure which program you went to but talk about how important the concept and the context is um, I've had a lot of graduate students even before looking at the work they're reading the work so what are your thoughts uh, of that in the art world yeah or if you experience kind of this division yeah absolutely context is is definitely always in play it, you know it really depends on which scenario we're, we're talking about you know give me a scenario and i'll tell you how important the context is right um but I think another way to get at your question is there, there's art that's a lot more commercial. Um, I often sort of make this distinction, or I have in the past, between what I refer to as the juxtapose art world, you know, and then the fine art world. And yeah. there's a little bit of crossover there, but they are kind of distinct. They're often distinct uh art worlds you know like my and and i'm aware of that to the extent that the way that i sort of have adapted my catchphrase for the podcast is i say um this is the conversation a podcast that goes behind the scenes and between the lines of the contemporary art worlds plural right notice that i'm not saying art world so yeah, I mean, I th- it's funny that you make that, you talk about these categories, the commercial art and fine art. So I take that to mean, in the context of the, what we're talking about, kind of the work that is more juxtaposed work versus work that is, a, you know, more fine art, for lack of a, a very lacking uh, of a better term. But, you know, yeah, I mean, there's the, there's the street tradition, you know, um, and uh, there's the comics sort of tradition and cartoon tradition. And, you know, all those are sort of mixed in or, or related when you're talking about the, um, the commercial kind of s- juxtaposed sort of art versus this more fine art. And there, yeah, there's, there's a lot of distinction there. Um, some of it gets through to or, or sort of makes it through the the wall you know of the the high art world you know and a lot doesn't um and i i and generally i mean uh i find a lot of commercial art to be really i think commercial sometimes is a euphemism you can be a euphemism for sellout it can also be a euphemism for easy um and and other people i'm sure have their what what terms they might use. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I know I sound a little bit elitist uh, in saying this, but yeah, I think a lot of commercial art is, um, is easy. And what I mean by that is um, not for- Yeah, it's surface people. Yeah. People understand it. And that, that's why when I, I, one of the things I enjoy about having this conversation with you is you can kind of, after you've, you've touched upon certain things, you understand you know the complexity of your work because if someone's just seeing your work visually with no context they could just say oh did he just throw a filter on 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 photoshop and then achieve this image and there's this whole process that you know you got to understand about this technique as well which right i used to tell artists when they're a painter and they do something on canvas are they thinking about all the painters that came before them, you know, right. whether it's from Picasso to Caravaggio, you know, what does it mean to put a, um, 
a brush the canvas and and i think today uh, especially during uh with COVID, you found a lot more artistic minds came into the marketplace. And I love to hear kind of the thoughts from artists that have been doing this. I call them the seasoned veterans uh, like yourself. What are their thoughts on it and how that has a kind of either helped them or affected them uh, in that sense? Because me on the business end, I'm seeing, I'm just seeing uh, they almost, it looks like a product to me. Right. And there's, different categories as i said I, I i make a strong distinction between fine artists just the umbrella term and commercial artist right um as the other there, there's nothing wrong with being on either side i think it's interesting you're finding more today with the nft more artists are identifying as commercial artists meaning mm. the idea of this art is to make money like right they want to create an image that people are interested in and then you know the art that you're creating, these are sometimes kind of tough subject matters that yeah. people just don't want to talk about. And I yeah. think it's important that artists are making work about these uh, tough subjects because it's a documentation of history, meaning yeah, this is going to be relevant in 10 years. It's relevant right now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is not a, this is not a, I mean, it is a problem in the sense of the, uh, affordable housing and, and income inequality people experience it day to day and and uh i'm very uh thankful that artists like yourself are uh tackling work like this that uh, i feel needs to be done uh, thank you yeah well let me let me respond particularly to the point about making money i mean i'm not against I would, let me be clear. I would love to sell this work. You know what I mean? And I, and I have sold some of it, but I would like to sell a lot more. Um, I think there are collectors out there who would be a good fit for this work. I don't think it's not, not collectible work by any means. Um, and to your earlier point about context, you know, and NFTs and digital and so on, this work really needs to be in, seen in person, you know what I mean, to, to really get it, you know, it does not translate that well. I mean, you can say that about most work, really, but even more so with mine, you know what I mean? You really see the presence of the work and the, the some of the, you, you can get a sense of some of the process that went into it when you see them in person that you have a hard time seeing you know, in, in reproductions, particularly digital reproductions. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I guess I want to address too this concept of artists who are commercial, who are, that is like, like the ones who are getting into NFTs that you mentioned, like they want to make money or that's why they're making the work. I, I just, I wonder, I always wonder, you know, when that's sort of the first item on the agenda, how that affects the quality of the work, how that affects the compromising of the artist, you know, if, if they're going to make their checklist um, based on that, you know what I mean? As opposed to the other way around that you work from the needs of the work itself, you know, the integrity of the work, the um, ultimate objectives of the work based on your, the, what you think about, you know, what you think about the world, as well as what you think about art history. And, and, and one other thing that you, you made me think of too, when you talked about the painters that you've worked with, you know, who are working on canvas saying, you know, you have to think about every other artist working on canvas that came before you, right? That is partly <clears throat> what led me to making the work that I make and using the complicated process that I make because this is a process, this is a result that you don't see anywhere, right? I don't want my work to look like, you know, Joe Blow, Chain Blow, et cetera, you know? It's your unique DNA, I think. Yeah. To that, um, a lot of artists, because I'm, uh, I experienced the, the commerce side of the art business, I have a lot of artists that will ask me, oh, what should I paint? What's going to sell? And for me, my stance is I want artists 
to be interested in what they're interested in. And then for me, that's a whole marketing. That, that's a separate conversation. It has nothing to do with the art, meaning everything has a market if you market it uh, well enough. And I think, you know, some people, it's what makes commercial art easier is because they know a majority has these interests. So if I take an example of like, you take someone like Andy Warhol, who is very commercially successful and his work is all over the world. And someone says, oh, um, people like Marilyn Monroe. So I should make a Marilyn Monroe. There's plenty of artists who can create a fabulous image of Marilyn Monroe. Um, and most of them are creating that image because they understand that people um, desire that image. Now, those ideas, there's plenty of artists who've, who've, who've talked about the idea where it touches on the commercialism, Andy Warhol being one of them. So are those ideas as interesting in 2021? Probably not. But, you know, a lot of people get it in the now visually. And they're not really thinking about art. Um, yeah. Deeper. And there's, there's certain art on the spectrum, which is considered fine art, which goes over most people's heads. Uh, there was a article I read a while back where I think it was a museum in Germany threw out the art because they thought it was trash. They just didn't know. And then you have that side of the art world where it's like, okay. And I think every artist needs to kind of find the happy medium without kind of like, because every artist should, it's, this is, you know, every artist should be able to, to have a fruitful career and it should make a living, even though it's, it's one of these tough professions. A lot of it is, is educating the clientele. What, what interests me about NFTs right now is they have this massive reach that gets a lot of exposure in media. It's definitely doing a lot for some of the artists who haven't gotten uh, necessarily insight or, or didn't get the um, credibility that they deserved in the medium that they chose. Because to me, the medium is just the vessel of which the art is being kind of carried out by. Um, much like your process. And I think a lot of artists right now, the lure is just to go to what's popular um, but it definitely potentially compromises the art because it has nothing to do uh, with the art. That's why when I hear a lot of these artists saying, oh, I'm just going to translate my images to NFTs, I ask them, well, how does that, where does that conceptually align with it? Like, what's the reason for it? Where does that, does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I think I, a lot of the times I can't even have some of these conversations with certain creators that they're only fixated on uh, the surface of it. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think the art education is so important. I think there's been this kind of movement against uh, certain institutions, but a lot of times when you've been through that realm, it, it allows a certain type of thinking uh, to happen uh, and certain conversations uh, to come up with. I started uh, in school, I left, but I at least got exposed to what those conversations look like. So I'm able to participate. Yeah. Yeah, there, <clears throat> there is actually specifically been a little bit of a backlash against MFA education because particularly because they've become so expensive, especially if it's a private institution. For sure. It's, it's ridiculously I've, expensive. I, I, talked about that on, on previous uh, podcasts uh, where I, I say some artists get what I would call MFA syndrome, where it pumps you up in a, in a, in a certain good way, but it also there's kind of a negative to it of, of how there needs to be this balance between these kind of deep thoughts and, and, and really the way we want to think about art. And then you have to kind of dial it back to, okay, you still got to reel in the people that aren't there um with yeah. the art um michael yeah. we're i we're, we're definitely gonna have to do a part two to this because i have a lot more uh questions uh that i want to ask one more time can we plug in the artists uh the the listeners and people listening um check out his website michaelshawstudio.com also your your podcast where can they listen to that 
theconversationpod.com or just look up the conversation art podcast on whatever platform you listen on and if i could also add my instagram handle at michael shaw studio um and at the con at artist podcast for the for the podcast Guys, check out his work. Really great work. I'm looking forward. We're definitely going to probably have a part two awesome. um, for this. Thanks so much. And looking forward to hearing from you guys on our next episode. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into the Art Matcher podcast. We had an interesting discussion, a great time, and we hope you did too. Please tune in for next week's episode. And like, share, and follow. For more information about the app, you can check out our website at artmatcher.com or look us up on social. Stay safe and be artful.